Hello, and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church in Germantown's third Sunday in Advent service of worship. I am the head pastor, the Reverend Rebecca Seegers, and it is my joy and privilege to have you worshiping with us today. This third Sunday in Advent, the theme is joy. You will see that my joy candle in the Advent wreath we created at our Faith at Five service is now lit. And the first item that I would like to lift up to you during welcome and announcements is the Christmas joy offering. We've invited Dick Liberty to give us a minute for mission for that. Dick? Good morning. I'd like to speak to you for a few minutes about the Christmas Joy Offering, which is our challenge offering for the month of December. You know, in Luke 10, where Jesus gives the parable of the Good Samaritan, an expert in the law asks Jesus what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus asks him what the law says, and he correctly answers with, the great commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and the second commandment, like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. But then he kind of wants to trap Jesus, and he asks, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus gives him the parable of the Good Samaritan. At the end of it, he asks of the three people, a priest, a Levite and a Samaritan who encountered the man who was beaten, which of those people was the good neighbor? And he says, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus says, you're right, go and do likewise. Well, I think in some ways, the work of the Christmas joy offering allows each one of us to also be a good Samaritan to show mercy to people that we don't even know. The Christmas Joy Offering has two beneficiary organizations. One of those is the racial ethnic schools and leadership programs of the denomination. And the other is the assistance program of the Board of Pensions. The racial ethnic schools offer education, both scholastic and spiritual, to young people in high school or college who might not be able to get an education or afford an education on their own without the help of the Christmas Joy Offering. The leadership programs do the same thing that Rebecca talked about last week in her sermon, that it helps build people's spiritual lives by the help of a mentor or by us standing on the shoulders of people who have come before us. So the leadership programs partner an individual or a group of young people with an adult leader and gives the young people opportunities to do things like lead a Bible study or a youth group activity, plan and carry out a community service or uh, project, or to do something like our disciples team, organize and play in uh, Christian sports leagues. Uh, the Board of Pensions Assistance Program uses Christmas Joy offering money in four different programs. Two of those, the Income Supplement Program and the Housing Supplement Program, are meant exclusively to help retired ministers, missionaries, lay workers of the church, and their surviving spouses who've had a certain number of years of service to the church and participation in the benefits plan and whose income is on the lower end of the financial scale. Income supplements just give an extra check, a little extra money to qualified people to help them uh, meet their needs, whatever those are. The housing supplement program is meant specifically to help with the payment 
of rent, mortgage, utilities, or retirement home fees for people who are in that same retired category and on the low end of the socioeconomic scale. The other two programs that the assistance program runs are meant to help people with emergency situations. They're called shared grants or emergency assistance grants, and they help both active church workers or retired church workers. Most of what those programs help with are extraordinary medical expenses, hearing, dental, sometimes vision, um, but it could be other things as well. Uh, loss or damage to a car through an accident or a home through a natural disaster if it isn't going to be covered by insurance. So there are all these different programs that are benefited by the Christmas Joy offering. And they will, of course, help people that you've never met and that you won't even know very much like the Good Samaritan and the man who was beaten on the road. So I hope you'll give generously to the Christmas Joy offering this year and uh, become a Good Samaritan. Show mercy even to someone that you haven't met yet. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Next on our list of items uh, that are joyful to lift up as we celebrate this season in new and different ways, instead of the Christmas festival this year, the Christian Education Committee has come up with a new way for us to safely celebrate the season. They are hosting a living nativity with families and children dressed up in family units, safely socially distanced, as participants in the Nativity story, Mary, Joseph, the babe, the shepherds, the wise men. We will have live animals there as well, sheep and donkeys and the like. And the doors of the sanctuary will be open that we might be able to hear Christmas carols being played on the McLean Memorial organ as you drive through the parking lot, the east parking lot, and view the nativity. So we hope that you will come on Saturday, December 19th from 1.30 to 2.30 to enjoy this living nativity celebration of Christmas and also lift it up to others who are looking for things to do that will remind them of the reason for the season, even in this challenging time. Additionally, I would like to lift up to you that on Christmas Eve, we will, as usual, even though it's virtual, be hosting the worship service beginning at 7 with a special Christmas concert beginning at 6.30. There will be an anthem, an offertory anthem, and an opportunity for you to sing in the congregational choir the final hymn, Joy to the World. If you would like to do that, there is information that has been emailed out. If you have not gotten it, you may contact me or our Director of Music Ministry, John Walthausen at jwalthausen at fpcgermantown.org. And we will get you all the information you need to sing in your own home and yet be viewed, hopefully 20 or 30 of us, singing congregationally that those on Christmas Eve might sing with a community of faith. If you're going to do that, your recording is due tomorrow. So there's a little bit of time left to participate. I also want to let you know that you will be receiving in short order, hopefully late this week or early next week, a box that has in it all sorts of items to help you celebrate that service in community. You will receive the Christmas candles that you would ordinarily hold inside our sanctuary that you might light the candle at home, even as others across the city and the community are doing so. 
And there are many other items, the bulletin, the new directory, all kinds of things that will be in that box for you so that you know we love you and you are a part of our community. If you are not a member of the congregation and would like to receive a box, please contact me at rseegers at fpcgermantown.org and we will be sure to get you on the list. Now, I would like to lift up our congregational meeting, which will be happening after worship today, and invite Bob Seed to give the call. Good morning. Notice is hereby given that the congregational meeting of the Congregation of the First Presbyterian Church in Germantown in the County of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, will be held on Sunday, December 13th, 2020, via Zoom, following the worship service at 11.30 a.m. The following will be presented during this meeting, the annual report for 2020, the preliminary budget for 2021, and the pastor's terms of call for 2021. Any other business which properly comes before the congregation may be transacted at this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. A couple more announcements before we enter into worship. This is what happens when you are an active, vibrant, vital congregation, even in the midst of pandemic. First of all, I want to let you know that the grief group will not be meeting tomorrow. That's Monday, December 14th, as Reverend Kevin Porter has some presbytery duties for that day. But it will resume as per usual the following week. Additionally, uh, I would like to let you know that there is still an opportunity to pledge securely online at this address here, or you will find it in the email with the bulletin or on the Facebook link, or you may also send in your pledge through the pledge card that was mailed to you through uh, the regular mail. So please, if you have not yet, consider making a financial commitment to the First Presbyterian Church in Germantown for 2021 as we continue to strive to do the mission and ministry to which we are called in this community and beyond. Now, come, let us worship the Lord. We want everything to look best, the decorations of the season, our homes with the lights and with their lights and tinsel, wreaths and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it is tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of the season. Not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul the beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. Well, come, well, come, well, come, well.
Friends, week after week, when we gather at this time, uh, one of the most important things we do is remind ourselves that we are not God. Actually, no one that we deal with in this world is God. And it's important for us to remind ourselves weekly and to speak truth of who we are and uh, the ways that we have fallen short of God's will for us. This week, however, it's important to focus on another side of that coin, which is that while we are not God, all of us are able to be vessels of God's blessing once we silence all the false voices and put aside all the false gods. So, in order for us to be uh, the uh, mothers and fathers of the new thing God is doing in and through us, let us speak truth of how we've fallen short by confessing our sins. God of the prophets, we give thanks for the voices that cry out and demand our attention. They call us to put our trust and hope in you. Forgive us when we close our eyes to your vision and when we stop our ears to your promise. Heal our weakness when we give up on ourselves, on one another, and on you. Free us from hopeless living that we may joyfully love and serve others in your holy name. Friends, hear God's good news for you and for me. For while it is true that we have sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. To all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say, in Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. Believe the good news of this gospel. Amen. This week, we lit the candle of joy to be alongside our candles of peace and hope. May that peace candle shine brightly in you and through you, even here and now, as you exchange signs of it to all you encounter. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let us pray. Speak with authority in our lives, Christ. Speak to us and to what is in us so that we might be whole. Speak to us with love, with hope, and with strength so that we might hear you and know deep inside that we are your people and that you are our God. Let it be so. Amen. A reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses in the Negab. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping 
bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the young people to join me at this time. Hey, everybody. Are you enjoying the lead up to Christmas? Do you hear the word joy in there? I am thinking about what a joy it is that we are able to celebrate Christmas openly and faithfully. You know, it wasn't always that way. As a matter of fact, in the early days of Christianity, before Emperor Constantine made it the official religion of the empire, back in the time after Jesus' death and resurrection, for the first 300 years or a little bit more of Christianity, Christians were persecuted. They were not allowed to worship God in Jesus Christ. And if you were discovered, you could be tortured and even killed. So if you were a Christian and you were traveling to another town or you wanted to visit a house church or you were even trying to find out about the faith and you wanted to become a Christian, there were secret signs and symbols to let you know who it was safe to talk to. And one of those was the fish. And that is because, if you remember, Jesus said he was going to make disciples fishers for people. So sometimes you might even see that symbol, the symbol of the fish, out in the world today, right? You might see it on the, on the back of a, a car, on the bumper sticker, or you, you might see it on our sign at the church with the rainbow inside it. And one of the ways that started was that if people were going from place to place and they wanted to try and figure out if somebody was a Christian, but do it in a way where they could, wouldn't get caught if that person wasn't, is while they were just standing in the square or standing on the road, they would take their toe and they might just dig it in the earth, looking like they were sort of just, you know, talking, but doing this motion that would look like this. So they do that in the earth, and if the person they were talking to wasn't a Christian, they wouldn't think anything of it. But if they were, they would take their toe in the earth and make the symbol like that. So that then the person would know, yes, this is a Christian. This is someone I can talk to, someone who knows the sign of the fish. And you may or may not know that the word for fish in Greek is ichthus. Now, ichthus you might recognize if you know about the study of fish. Have you ever heard of ichthyology? Ichthyology is the study of fish. And the word ichthus in Greek is spelled like this. Each of these is a capital letter that is the iota, chi, theta, Upsilon and Sigma, and it spells ichthus. And another really cool thing is that the word iota, or the letter iota, is the first letter in Greek for the word Jesus, Yesu. And the word, and the letter uh, chi is the first letter in the word Christ. And theos is the word for God. So the theta is the first letter in the word for God. The u, weos, is the first letter. Weos is the word for sun. And the upsilon is the first letter in that. And the sigma is the first letter in the word for savior. So each letter stands for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. So ichthus isn't just a fish that symbolizes to be fishers of men, but it also stands for a really, really fun acronym. 
And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you about this today, rather than in January, when we do the scripture about Jesus fishing for people, is because I was thinking about this X, this first letter in the word Christ, and how sometimes people shorten Christmas to Xmas. And I don't know about you, but I've heard people say, oh, they shouldn't do that. They're Xing out Christ's name. But they're not. They're not. This X, this Chi, is the letter that is the first letter in the word Christ. And so, really, we're saying Christ Mass. And in reality, Mass was the word for the early church's worship. And sometimes, some traditions, they still call worship mass, right? So Christmas, Xmas, is really about a day where we worship Christ as God's Son, the Savior of us all. That is something to feel joy about. Amen? Amen.
lesson today is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 16 through 24. Listen for God's word to you. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of prophets. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. God, we thank you for your word. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the words we heard read today from your holy book. And now, as we listen to these words which come from my lips, I most humbly pray that you would pour through me the gift of preaching, that they remain no longer simply my words, but instead are transformed into your living word to each and every person who hears them, that they might be met in exactly their place of need. We pray this, Lord, in great anticipation and in the strong name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. By my birth date, I am in what is known as the baby boomer generation. Now, anyone who knows me knows that I have a very, very big problem with this. I just simply do not fulfill the criteria of baby boomers. As a matter of fact, if you take any quiz and, and are asked any questions about uh, how these generations work, I inevitably come up as a Gen Xer. So I have for years argued that the generation is too big that there's a 25-year span from 1940 to 1965, and it is too big that people that are born at the beginning of that phase to the end of that generation do not have enough in common to be part of the same generation. And I don't belong there. I belong in the next one up. That has been my argument. Now, about a year ago, I went to a conference where I heard Diana Butler Bass speak. Now, Diana Butler Bass is a theologian and historian whom I greatly admire and respect. I have several of her books. I was so excited to hear her at this conference, and she was, as always, brilliant. But here's the thing. Her birth date is just a few months before mine, and she planted herself firmly as a baby boomer 
in one of her lectures, I was thunderstruck. Could I be wrong? I'm, I am a baby boomer? Well, if she is, aren't I? I struggled with this whole idea of generation. Where do I fit? And, and I think in reality, by my temperament, by you know, all of those criteria that define generations, notwithstanding my birth date, I probably don't belong in the baby boomer generation. I am more of a Gen Xer in my sensibilities. I am, if you will, sort of out of sync with my generation. I don't fit in the traditional parameters. That is where we find the Thessalonians today. Paul is writing to the people in Thessalonica. And one of the first things you need to know is that this is actually the oldest book in the New Testament. If you were going to put the books of the New Testament in chronological order, 1 Thessalonians would be first in the New Testament. It is written sometime in the late 40s, early 50s, so just 15 to 20 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And the thing is, the teachings that Paul has gone out to give have said that Jesus is coming, that Jesus will return. This generation will not pass away before Jesus' return. And yet, this generation is beginning to pass away. And the people in Thessalonia are, are, are perplexed. They, they want to know what is going to happen to Uncle Bob and Aunt Jenny, to Grandpa and the cousins that have passed on. Are, are, are they going to heaven to meet Jesus? What is going on if Jesus has not returned to lift them up with him in the second coming. So a lot of what Paul is doing in this first letter is trying to tell them how to live between the advents. The first advent of Christ's birth and the second advent of Christ's return. And this is exactly where we are today as well. We are in that in-between time, that in-between generation before Jesus' return, in that watching and waiting phase. Even as we're watching and waiting to celebrate Christ's birth, we're also watching and waiting for Christ's return. And how are we to live in the interim? That is what Paul is discussing in the passage we heard today. He's saying, this is how you do it. You rejoice. Now, this is perfect for this third Sunday in Advent, isn't it? When, when joy is our theme. Rejoice, Paul says. Well, woohoo. Kind of hard to rejoice when things are as challenging as they are. And I think the people of Thessalonica were feeling the same way. Kind of hard to rejoice in this challenging time when we are being persecuted for following Jesus. Kind of hard for us to rejoice in these times when we continue nine months in to be in isolation as COVID cases rise and we are now. 3,000 deaths a day. Over 300,000 deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. That is a hundred times the number of people who died on 9 11. A hundred times. And we all know of people who have died, if, if we've not had people in our lives who have died of this disease. It is overwhelming 
How do we rejoice in the midst of, of hospitals to overflowing and ICU beds being maxed out? How do we rejoice in, in, in even while a vaccine is, is coming and has just been approved for distribution, we don't know how long it's gonna be before it gets to us or if it's even safe for us. How do we rejoice in the midst of this apocalyptic time? Paul answers that too. Rejoice, he says, pray without ceasing. Be constantly in prayer. I remember when my daughter was little, she asked me, mommy, when we pray to God, when we ask God for something, does God always give it to us? And I said, well, no, honey, it, it doesn't always work that way. And she said, well, then why would we pray if we aren't going to get what we ask for? And I said, because the purpose of prayer is not to change God. The purpose of prayer is to change us. When we center ourselves in prayer, and especially when we use the end of the prayer that Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, thy will not mine be done. When we pray in that way, our hearts are changed and we are able to live more fully into God's will for us. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Phew. Give thanks in all circumstances? Especially right now, that seems incredibly challenging, doesn't it? But here's the thing, Paul doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances, he says in all circumstances. And the Greek word is actually ain, which is epsilon nu, what we would see as an en. So it very much is in, it's not epi, which would be translated more as for or over. Give thanks in all circumstances, no matter what you are going through, give thanks. From 1929 to 1940, a, a 10 year or slightly larger span, there was one of the worst droughts in history in the American Southwest. Rain did not come for a decade. Everything began to die. And indeed, there was even a bark beetle that, that came during this time when all of the gorgeous pinion trees were beginning to to become very dry and brittle. And the bark beetle exacerbated their death until thousands of trees were decimated. Their needles fell to the ground and the trees were gone. This caused one of the biggest migrations from this area into California of people who were farm workers and migrant workers. And the people who remained were surrounded by a landscape that was gray and dead. And then one summer, it rained. And within days, flowers bloomed, plants came up, yellow cowpin daisies and purple asters, flowers of great variety and color. The plains were awash with vibrancy. It was one of the most beautiful sights that, that the people who were there had ever seen and made all the more so by the 10 years of drought before it. But here's the thing. Some of those flowers that had not been seen for over a hundred years in the American Southwest were only able to bloom because of the death of those same pinion trees. Those, those trees, when they disintegrated, when they decayed, when, when the, the pine needles decayed, they provided nutrients and mulch for the ground that enabled long dormant seeds to come to life again. It was only out of the death and the pain that had gone before that this beautiful restoration was able 
to happen. This is the theme of Psalm 126 in our scripture readings today. Psalm 126 promises that the Lord is with us in those challenging times and will restore our fortunes. That those who go out in mourning will come back with shouts of joy. That those who go out to sow while weeping will bring back sheaves of wheat in joyous refrain. Psalm 126 talks about this, this restoration in a way that, that shows us, that lets us know the promise of the good news in Jesus Christ. You see that word generation? It has two meanings. Generation, the way that I spoke about it at the beginning of this sermon, a generation being a span of years in between which a certain group of people live. So there are generations of human life, generations of years, but generation also has another meaning. That of being creative, generative, generating a new thing. And so here is what I believe we are called to do, to be as followers of God and Jesus Christ, to rejoice, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks in all circumstances. And then we will be the restoration generation that aids in restoration generation, in the generation of God's love, justice, and mercy on earth. As we watch, as we wait, as we expect the advent, the return of God in Jesus Christ and the coming of the kingdom, we are called to rejoice, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks in all circumstances that restoration generation might come through us, in us, along with the God who brings it all to fruition. Amen.
Friends, in this season of waiting, one of the important things we can do is to keep ourselves mindful that God is with us in the waiting. So let us recite the words of the Apostles' Creed as a meditation, reminding us of the God who is with us even here and now. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And it is this belief in the one true living God who is in us, who uses us to uh, recreate and renew and restore and resurrect that gives us the faith to come to God just as we are in prayer. Let us pray. Uh, loving and gracious God, we come to you this week uh, deep in the season of Advent, much aware of this season of waiting in the midst of a year of waiting, a waiting for pandemic to be over, a waiting for the transition in our uh, federal government to take place fully, awaiting for the injustices that have been known by many for a long time and for some as a new revelation to be made right, awaiting to be in each other's presence again, awaiting. Lord, remind us that waiting is a part of your plan that it isn't a time of idleness, but it is, is truly a time to pause and reflect, to gain perspective, to be reminded that although day by day may indeed seem to be the same, when we look back, we can see your hand working through the generations and the years of our life. And as we look forward, we can redirect ourselves from the trajectory that we might have had and with that perspective embrace a future that only we can fulfill in your name. Lord bless us in this time of waiting with the recognition that only what we do for you and for building up your kingdom and for incarnating love in this moment in its fullness with all we encounter, only those things last. Only those things ultimately are meaningful. Grant us the grace to let go of any false idols, whether those are impressions of ourselves or others, and to embrace the calling of how we are indeed blessed. Allow us to recognize the gifts inside of us that we are to hold and to nurture and to grow and to bring forth into this world, even as Mary was informed of that by the angel. And grant us the grace to see the same blessing gifts unknown to us, being held in stewardship in each and every individual, whether in human eyes, we would view them as high or lowly. Come by here in this time of waiting, grant us peace, joy, hope, and love. So that when we step out into the future you ordain, we would do so more fully incarnating the words our Lord and Savior taught us 
as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yes, brothers and sisters, we have already received many gifts through God. And we have much to offer others. And I would invite you to prayerfully consider how God may be calling you to use the first fruit of your labor, your time, your talents, your all, to uplift the ministries of Jesus Christ through the First Presbyterian Church in Germantown, either by using the link before you at fpcgermantown.org slash giving, or by sending tithes and offerings to the First Presbyterian Church in Germantown, 35 West Shelton Avenue, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19144. Thanks be to God.
Now, as you enter the week ahead, may you be a part of that restoration generation. May you rejoice, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, knowing that the God we call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all is with you and in you and flowing through you, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>